who will be sharing. Good morning, everyone uh, here in the room and as well as in the virtual world, I think in Jamaica and anywhere else where you may be. I now open hearing number 25 of the 188th period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is entitled Human Rights of People Deprived of Liberty in Jamaica. This is an ex officio hearing in the sense that it's uh, the hearing that has been formulated uh, and requested by the commission itself. My name is Roberta Clark, and I'm the second vice president of the commission and also the country rapporteur for Jamaica. And I'm accompanied uh, to my right by Commissioner Jose Luis Caballero, who is also the rapporteur for Human Rights Defenders. And thank you for being here, Commissioner. I'm also here with uh, the special rapporteur on economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights, Mr. Javier Palumo, who is, I want to say, a new rapporteur, but maybe he's been here at least a month now? Two months. Two months now, so maybe not so new. Welcome, Javier. And um, to my furthest right, uh, Mr. Jorge Mesa, who is the Deputy Secret Executive Secretary of the Commission. Um, the objective of this hearing is to present information regarding human rights of persons deprived of liberty. And uh, for us at the Commission, the ex officio hearing will further our efforts to make visible experiences, challenges, as well as achievements. Um, well, I should say uh, experiences and challenges that persons deprived of liberty face in the recognition and exercise of their rights um, in Jamaica and in extension, of course, the Americas and the Caribbean to the extent that that um, experience is shared. And it's also an opportunity to get uh, information on any good practices in addressing the question of redressing and ensuring rights of persons deprived of liberty. I want to also explain that uh, today, the rep there will be no representative of the state. The state won't be appearing uh, at this hearing. As you recall, in July, we were requested by the state to postpone the hearing so that they would have a sufficient opportunity to, to get uh, information on the hearing and to prepare. 
Um, and we also received a communication two days ago uh, indicating that the state would not attend this hearing. So with that, I would like to say how we're going to spend our time together. Um, the hearing is uh, typically an hour and a half long, but we expect that we, we may complete within an hour and 15 minutes because the state is not here. So we started by giving the civil society, you have 40 minutes to um, present. Um, and then the commission has 20 minutes, up to 20 minutes to make comments or ask questions for clarification. And then the civil society has another opportunity to respond to what the commissioner said and to amplify uh, what, it, what it wishes to say, including any recommendations you wish to make. And then we close. So with that, I want to invite civil society to take the floor and also to introduce yourself. We have time. So please don't speak too quickly. Don't be rushed. And also recognize that they, they, there is interpretation, so the interpreters have to keep up with us. So over to you, uh, civil society, and please do introduce yourselves as you start. Good morning. Uh, my name is Carla Bullotta. I am the executive director of Standard for Jamaica. And we really want to thank you for this opportunity to share with you our experiences. Standard for Jamaica is a human rights NGO. And uh, among the projects, the biggest projects that we have is at Correctional Services where we work since 2007, promoting rehabilitation and reintegration and running an amount of programs, which are education, professional skill, and psychological aid to try to use the serving time as free time. It's a time along that people can learn to be different, uh, create a different mindset, and leave the institutions with some opportunities. My task is to give you some numbers. So let me start with the numbers. The correctional services in Jamaica have a population of roughly 4,000 inmates. There are 11 correctional institutions and only two are female, one for adults and one for girls, juveniles. Uh, the other ones are all males, three are high risk inmates, and the other ones are mild or middle risk. The population uh, of the, the institution are heavily overcrowded, apart the two females. The female institution, the adult female institution, has an average between 120 and 140 males. Obviously, numbers are flexible and it's not to it. The juvenile institute, institution, the girls, has actually 76 uh, girls. There are two institutions for male juveniles, and all together have a population of around 320 boys. Um, the institutions are heavily overcrowded, especially three. Tower Street General Penitentiary, which is a high security one, has been built and taught for 800 inmates, and there is a population of over 1,700. St. Catherine Institution in, in Spanish Town which was built for 600 inmates, and actually there are around 1,000. Infrastructures are very poor. El Cazar is a daily thing. Um, we have been using this opportunity as a human rights group to promote rehabilitation because I think that is one of the key elements to fight crime and violence. Going back to numbers, 
according to the report from the ECS, uh, out of three people living in the institution, one is coming back. So it's a real offender. In, uh, among the numbers of those which are on rehabilitation, basically there is almost nobody. In five years, we had six coming back, you know, which means it works. It means that a second chance is possible. It means also that if you invest in rehabilitation, you invest in reducing crime rate because you send back to families and society people which are able to stay far from a crime, crime increase. Still with the numbers, we have to admit that the rehabilitation is not involved the majority of the population. Um, just to give an example, in Tower Street, where the population is 1,700, at school, we have around 300 inmates. Reason why is the poor infrastructure, which cannot hold all those which are willing to part of rehabilitation. Most of the people are applying to, to be part of it, but we are compelled not to take them in because we don't have space for them, which is really sad. Um, rehabilitation projects have scored some huge success. Uh, last year, the CFC exams, we have the school, schools which are going from remedial level to CFC. And last year, the CFC scores were 76, which is very high. We also have a pilot project with the University of Commonwealth Caribbean, which is granting a degree. Uh, our pilot project of five has placed our five among the best 25 ones in a badge of 690 students. And the other ones were obviously out of the institution. Therefore, they were in a different environment. Uh, such, such success has encouraged us to increase the project. And actually we have 11, which are following the following badge. And they, all of them were excellent marks and excellent results in the first year of the classes, which are lasting two years. While those which have finished the first degree have been asking and applied to continue to achieve the full master. I think uh, these elements are extremely important because they give you the, the, the feeling that what you do is on the right path. We try to verify our projects every six months to see how best we can implement, but also how best we are able to make changes when we see that something needed to be addressed. Uh, the second element which I need to mention is the professional lab. 82% um, of the inmates, incarcerated people, do not have any skill, not only in terms of school, but in terms of professional skill. Therefore, our efforts are uh, going towards providing them with skills at different levels. We have some basic ones like welding or uh, tailoring, but we have high quality ones because we have been opening computer labs in all the institutions where they can learn how to use a computer, how to become a computer engineer, how to repair a computer, how to do graphics, how to do data entry classes. And we work in a part a partnership with the Heart Foundation because the a foundation is not only able to provide trainers, but is able to provide diploma, which is the most important thing. Um, one of the most outstanding lab is a music lab. I mention it because it's quite unusual, but Jamaicans are very talented for uh, music, etc. So we open an opportunity to have something a little different from what is habitual. And we have been uh, graduating people uh, learning to play an instrument, but also becoming sound engineer, sound technician, backstage technician, which is something which is instrumental 
to provide them with a job. Um, the last element that you see on the screen is entrepreneurship. I want to explain why we decided to develop that aspect of the program. Uh, those which are living in the institution, well rehabilitated, have some expectations to get a job, an opportunity. Uh, the main problem is that uh, once, wherever they apply for a job, once they learn where they're coming from, stigma is very high. Therefore, the, their application are refused. I also need to remind everybody that in Jamaica, none of the governmental agencies is allowed to employ an ex inmate. It is really something which should be addressed, especially in ministry like Ministry of Security, because Ministry of Security, which is the leader for the correctional services and is officially formally promoting rehabilitation, should be on the front line to promote the fact that somebody which has been an offender could be employed in a governmental agency. Saying that, it is obvious why we are promoting entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is a way to teach them something that they can do on their own. So they won't be in need to apply for a job. Uh, I just want to give an example. Cosmetology for the women is popular. They learn a skill. They learn something they can do from home. They learn something they can do in their communities. And they learn also not only the professional skill, how to do cosmetology, but we provide them with principle of business, which means how to manage your business in a proper way in order to know income, outcome, invoices, and all of that. Actually, today, we are starting two projects, two of the projects on cosmetology in two areas, one in Portland and one in Kingston, where we have ex inmates and abused women. I, we hope that this is a key to bypass the problem that stigma is uh, so high that most of them do not get a job. I think this is a key point which I really want to stress today because is rehabilitation has a sense and makes sense as far as we are able to give them a second chance. So rehabilitation and reintegration are going to get their hand in hand. If we do not provide the reintegration, basically, it doesn't make much sense to work on rehabilitation and we need to be aware that we can push them back to the same life that we are trying to change for them. In order to do that, also, we have psychological assistance and we have specific programs with various groups. We try to work a lot on self-awareness and self-control. Some might be habitual delinquents, but there is quite an amount of those which have been committing violent crimes which they did it because they lost control. They were drunk, they were under drugs, they were jealous. And we have, been we have been working on that specifically to teach them to control their emotional side. And the other thing that we have to do and is a priority for us, working and being part of rehabilitation also is admitting that you have been doing something wrong, which is have been affecting your life but also affect, heavily affecting the life of those which are victims of their crimes. There is no rehabilitation unless there is the truth and the fact that you admit about some wrongdoing. Um, we have specific classes on uh, that matter of psychological assistance, one for women and one for girls. For women, we realized how difficult it is for them sometimes to focus on the programs. So we were trying to verify why they are producing less than men. And uh, after uh, we had some sessions which are brought to light, the fact that all of them are children, the white majority, and they do not know what's happening to their children, if somebody is taking care of them, send them to school, buy them books and shoes. 
therefore are so stressed and anxious they cannot focus sometimes. And secondly, at correctional services, mothers are not allowed to see children often. A family day is twice per year, and that is not acceptable because it is completely, completely affecting the relationship between mother and child. So we are proposing that those uh, communication between a mother and children are much more open. Juveniles are children which are detained. In Jamaica, are children which are called uncontrollable can be detained. Uncontrollable beings are really behavior. After five years of lobby, finally the uncontrollable children have been abolished as those which should, live, should be in conflict with the law. They need help, but they have been regularly detained, and usually the average of them is 80% of the population of the criminal institution. Those children are heavily traumatized, extremely emotional, and not mature, and being incarcerated is increasing the level of trauma and we won't allow them to grow as a balanced person. So we have some special programs for them where we try not only to do counseling, but also to improve and showcase their talents because their self-esteem is below zero. So we try to tell them that they are beautiful, they have a value, they are able to do things. And every year we showcase what they learn to the families, trying to teach the parent that they should not have sent that child to a penal institution. The trauma is very high and also unluckily we still have this habit to put children in isolation if they do something wrong. We should not be permitted to lock a child in isolation for two weeks is totally compromising all the work which has been done with her and totally compromising her capability to maintain a sort of control. They are very violent, they're very aggressive, they're very frustrated, and all the work which has done before has basically been cancelled. Last element which I want to put on the table because I know that I cannot talk too long is uh, gender-based violence. Gender-based violence is affecting men and women in which are incarcerated. Most of the women, quite an amount of them, have been committing a crime as a reaction to years of abuses. Therefore, we have a problem, problem with them because they, they feel and that they are the victims of abuses. Just an example, six months ago, a lady which has been abused by her husband for years, been beaten up, house break, car burnt down, the man was entering through the windows in the night, finally decided to break up with him. The gentleman came into the house in the night, broke the window, attacked her, she self-defense herself and killed him. She got life sentence. I don't say that she should have killed him, but I cannot accept fact that she has been sentenced to such a uh, punishment. Men now, we are working on gender-based violence with men too, because if you do not change the mindset of the perpetrators and you only work with the victims, you won't be able to change the relationship. All of them are coming from environments where violence is a daily experience that is affecting men, women, and minors. Uh, families are monoparental, fathers are not there, children grow in the middle of the road, and the macho culture, the violence culture is deeply rooted. So trying to work with the men has been very interesting, and I think that we were not expecting such a positive reaction because they, they were telling us that they didn't know that there was another avenue. It's gonna be a long way to go. It's gonna be a very long way to go, but I think that we are determined to continue to do that, not only to the 
teach that but in the community please um just to end up my presentation i see on the screen that you see some of the little items that we produce with entrepreneurship this is for example our jewels as you can see and it is another way to allow especially women to achieve a professional skill and then we help them because at the end of the classes we provide them with some items that they can use to start um, their little business we also try to help them to market it so we have somebody which is a social worker which is following them and try to see what they can sell how they best they can do so if i have to finish as it looks like i would love to talk much better i can do it um first of all rehabilitation is a key let me reiterate that secondly if you do not link rehabilitation with reintegration rehabilitation could be a failure as it is we have people coming to our office after they are released with six subjects a heart diploma a data diploma an accountant diploma give them a second chance is the only way to keep them far from a crime life third i want to just mention very shortly if you allow me that in the correctional institution there is a prison in the prison where there are detained the members of the lgbtq community in jamaica homosexuality is punished by law and therefore the stigma is high sky high that means that those which are incarcerated for crimes related to that which is called boggery law are locked in a special block they cannot uh, be among the general population this is affecting them for many reasons but the major one is that they do not have access to rehabilitation projects they cannot go to school they cannot go to a professional lab so we have been carrying the school into the special we have been carrying a couple of professional lab into the special is not enough what is a way to do not cut any possibility for them to be still part of the rehabilitation project that we think and believe are a major instrument to fight crime in general thank you very much thank you very much ms gulotta and i Let's leave it with you to continue civil society organizations. And many thanks, Carla, for providing an overview of the state of rehabilitation and reintegration in Jamaica. Hello, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity. I'm Daisy Leslie, board member of Stand Up for Jamaica. And allow me to now turn your attention to some specific challenges related to remand and uh, the parole process in Jamaica. So on screen, you will see uh, uh, you know, the bar chart showing that Jamaica overall has an occupancy rate of 82% for all 11 of its correctional facilities. But according to the latest available economic and social survey of Jamaica, um, you would have heard Carla allude to it, St. Catherine Adult Correctional Center is operating 200% above its, um, its capacity and Tower Street 6.7%. Um, so we know that um, at least two of the maximum facilities, they are overcrowded, right? Based on the available st statistics. The implications of this are resource constraints, including insufficient staff and limited access to available rehab rehabilitation services. Of course, the scarcity of resources hampers the effective implementation of rehabilitation initiatives. Figure one also shows that when compared to its Caribbean counterparts, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, St. Kitts and Nevis, Jamaica's pre-trial detention population seems moderately small. But when we disaggregate these figures, we, we see that 68% of the child custodial population are actually on remand. 
This represents an increase from 2020 when roughly 53% of children in custody were on remand. And of course, detaining children without a clear legal basis or without proper considerations of alternatives raises several human rights concerns. International standards emphasize the need to prioritize the best interests of the child, and of course, explore non-custodial measures. Um, not only do um, this kind of detention disrupt um, a child's education, um, particularly as it re relates to mainstream schooling, but it has implications for me mental health and their well being with limited specialist support. As the current situation stands, no juvenile center or adult center has a residential psychologist. Um, but what we have is a team of two full time and two sessional psychologists, along with available interns and professional volunteers currently serving both the adult and the child custodial population. So we there's a sense that the that pretrial detention is being overused, especially with children in conflict with the law. And of course, this contradicts the provisions in international standards, including the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which Jamaica ratified and which provides for the limited use of pretrial detention only when certain conditions are present. You would have heard um, Carla speak of the, the issue of uncontrollable children. Well, a uh, majority of children admitted into the care of the DCS in 2021 were for uncontrollable behavior or disorderly conduct. And of course, in 2013, a pol policy decision was actually taken to reduce the number of children sent to the DCS for behavioral challenges. And there was even consideration given to changing the approach. Um, the government even went further in August 2013 to, you know, make, um, you know, a, a allow cabinet to approve amendments to the Child Care and Protection Act, which removed the option of a correctional order for children deemed to be uncontrollable. But this amendment is still yet to take effect. Um, so what we have is uh, children, you know, in need of supervision being unnecessarily criminalized when committed into the care of the DCS. Now, another issue was raised by the survey of persons deprived of liberty conducted by the Inter-American Development Bank in 2019, when the findings revealed that of the roughly 720 persons interviewed, 53.7% reported that they were not informed of their right to legal representation, and 59.1% reported that they did not give a prelimi preliminary statement in the presence of a justice or an attorney. This is in violation of Article 14.3b of the ICCPR, which clearly states that everyone charged with a criminal offense has the right to legal assistance of their choosing. And if, of course, a person cannot afford legal assistance, they're entitled to have legal aid assigned to them when the interests of justice require it. In terms of section 14 of the Jamaican constitution, there is you know, the provision that no person shall be deprived of his liberty except in accordance with fair procedures established by law. However, inmates have been deprived of this procedural right by the par parole process which they are qualified for once they serve at least one third of their sentence of more than 12 months. In 2022, 122 par parole applications were submitted to the parole board for consideration, but only 52.5% were granted and 41.8% refused. Um, of course, parole is granted to enable inmates to be released into open society for readjustment with the guidance of a probation officer. But again, the DCS reports that there are just not enough parole officers because currently the, 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 the probation officer um, is working 
that office is working 10.4% below the establishment of 182 officers. But the general overall process of parole lacks transparency. Um, research done by the Office of the Public Defender found that one of the reasons often given for the refusal of an, a parole application was that the board in its deliberation recommends that the, the applicants spend additional time in the institution to benefit from rehabilitation activities, but investi further investigations conducted and several studies have indicated that um, there are few rehabilitation activities in, in operation and if and when they are available, they're not accessible, always accessible to all. So on this basis, the reason for refusal might seem unfair and it's something that we definitely will need to look into further. There is also the question or the issue of um, whether or not inmates' right to a fair hearing is being breached as outlined by section 16.2 of the constitution. Um, and we see that in the case of um, where various reports are gathered about the applicant and made available to the parole board in, a, in accordance with the Parole Act. Um, but these documents which are collected and you know, used in the decision making process are not disclosed to the applicant. Um, as such, it's, it's difficult for the applicant to contest the, the reports which may contain information which he or she may consider pre prejudi prejudicial um, to his application. And so there is also the, the, the consideration of not knowing when a decision or how long the, the application process will take or when a decision will be made. Um, Section 75 of the Parole Act gives the, the parole board the power to invite an applicant for parole to be pre present at the hearing. But in a number of reports um, and a number of research studies uh, suggest that this power is not being utilized, at least not to the full extent, because in a number of cases, um, you know, applicants were not invited to attend the hearings. And so this is these are some of the challenges that we face with parole. How we deal with this, we can make a number of recommendations. I'd like to highlight three. Um, we'll, in support of the Office of the Public Defender's recommendation, we also agree that um, reports gathered about parole applicants must be disclosed to him or her um, at least 14 days be before the hearing so that he or his representative can have an op opportunity to challenge um, any adverse material contained therein, right? Um, secondly, measures and resources need to be put in place to ensure total compliance with the Child Care and Protection Act, the Beijing rules and the conventions on the rights of the child as ratified by Jamaica. And, of, and lastly, the prison sentence based on the number of children in Raman, 63% is just too much. So the prison sentence must um, in all cases be used as an absolute last resort, especially for vulnerable persons. And with that said, I'll hand over to Daniel. Uh, thank you, Stacia. All right, so I will be talking about the situation regarding mentally ill in correctional centers in Jamaica. Um, thanks again for the opportunity to be able to share um, some of Stand Up for Jamaica's findings and work. So uh, I wanted to talk a little about um, what the current situation is. And uh, um, I have some figures on the screen. In 2020, Indicom, the Independent Commission, released a report with some uh, damaging statistics regarding the situation of mentally ill inmates. And uh, one of the, I think, driving or motivating factors in producing that report 
had to do with the death of a man called Noel Chambers, who died in prison uh, at the age of 81 years old. And he had been detained since 1980 for 40 years. 40 years at the governor general's pleasure. He was deemed unfit to plead a charge of murder. So he was being held in custody without a trial for those 40 years. When he was found, he was found in his cell. He was um, severely malnourished. Uh, the report says he was full of vermin bites and infected with bed bugs. <clears throat> they come in their report following that discovery and review found that there were at least 146 mentally in ill inmates who had been held without trial as at January 2020. In fact, of that amount, 15 of those persons were held a period of, of over 30 years. One of the issues regarding why um, persons have, or the mentally ill have been held for such long periods of time have to do with severe uh, challenges within the system in ensuring that such inmates are properly, properly attended to by psychiatrists, that the proper reports are, repaired, are prepared by those psychiatrists, and that, that, that those reports are then sent to the court, and that there is proper and due diligence in the follow-up and bringing those matters to court so that their detention can be reviewed. So in the case of Noel Chambers, it was found that at least twice he had been certified by psychiatrists as to plead in 2007 and 2008, but had never been actually brought to trial. Um, there's a picture, and I apologize for um, the, the graphic nature of the photo. It was um, published online, published in the Indicom report. Uh, with the permission of his family, but it's just to highlight how the, the graphic nature and, and how important and severe the situation is regarding those who are mentally ill. Thank you. Can you go to the next slide? All right, so there are some legislative hurdles regarding access to justice. So previously, those who were mentally ill, um, they were detained on the law at the governor's pleasure. So this is the court's ability to uh, order that such persons be detained if they're deemed unfit to plead. There was an amendment to the law, um, the Criminal Justice Administration Act of 2011, which um, now changed the status from inmates being held at governor's pleasure to being held at the court's pleasure. Uh, now, what this has meant, and it introduced a whole procedure, which is really a procedural hurdle, for persons who have been detained in order to change their status. It requires that an application has to be made to the court to change their status. So inevitably those persons would need uh, legal representation, legal services in order to do so. And that is in order of itself, one of the challenges. Um, the onus of course is on the mentally ill inmates to initiate that review and it has to be um, a situation where they can be released in the custody of a caretaker or on conditions um, and subjected to further treatment. Um, the judge, of course, has the discretion as to where an inmate is kept. So even though the legislation contemplates that inmates can be, um, they can um, be remanded or sent to uh, 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 a mentally ill center. There are currently no such places that are within the Department of Personal Services control. And so inevitably um, they are sent to the prisons. Um, the court um, um, can of course commit those inmates and the court is not entitled to receive or rely on the opinion of a medical professional in making those orders. So it's within the court's complete discretion um, in terms of um, where to send those inmates. Next slide, please.
So uh, in a report, a brief that Stand Up for Jamaica commissioned um, with some assistance to some lawyers, uh, it was discovered that uh, there really is inhumane and degrading punishment and a breach of the right to personal liberty. So some constitutional breaches concerning uh, this whole process of the detainment of mentally ill persons who are deemed unfit to plead. Um, it was discovered that the Commission of Corrections is not sending routinely monthly reports to the Supreme Court as required to the courts, which is, is required by Section 25B of the Act. This is a process which allows the um, courts to, to assess continually what is the condition and status of the mentally ill. And the Registrar of the Supreme Court was not advising the court of whether these monthly reports were being sent. Um, so without that process um, of routinely checking in on the status of, of these mentally ill persons, um, the court is kept out of the loop. Uh, and matters are not brought before the court's attention. Um, as I mentioned before, there's no psychiatric institution for mentally inmates, specifically under the, the Department of Correctional Services control, and so all inmates are therefore held in regular prison with other um, inmates. Inmates are deterred for long periods, irrespective of whether their mental condition has improved. So even where psychiatrists have as I mentioned before, certified that persons have been to plead, they still remain in prison for long periods of time. And their detention in many of those cases exceeds any sentence that they were likely to have received if they, had con they were convicted. And of course, having been detained for such long periods of time, um, the result is that the case against them is no longer viable. Um, I wanted to mention um, the case of, so since the Indicom's report, Stand Up for Jamaica, well, prior to that, Stand Up for Jamaica was doing work on mentally ill, but since the Indicom report, um, Stand Up for Jamaica uh, has retained lawyers' assistance in trying to, to free some of those persons who have been detained for long periods of time. One such person um, was detained for 50 years without a trial and uh, he was released, finally released to um, the lawyers making an application, as I mentioned before, to the court um, in 2020. And in that case, um, the, the, the government offered um, compensation of only $6 million, irrespective of the fact that the man was detained um, for 50 years, for most of his um, working life and is now elderly and unable to work and support himself. Um, prior to Stand Up for Jamaica in becoming involved in that matter, his last listed court date was in 1970. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things um, I wanted to talk about had to do with the recommendations, and this is my final slide. We think that there needs to be a comprehensive, comprehensive mental health care strategy with qualified and skilled men, mental health professionals. Um, one of the situations um, that was highlighted by data is the fact that there are not enough psychiatrists that are servicing um, our prisons, so that needs to be addressed. Um, one of our recommendations also is to establish a specialized mental health court to deal with this backlog or, or deal to focus specifically on dealing with those mentally ill that are detained, especially those who are detained without trial. Um, we think there should be a special psychiatric facility um, that those persons could be committed to as opposed to being held in the general population. And we think that there also be, should be some way to divert at the point of arrest, to divert persons who are mentally ill, who do not pose a danger to society so that they're not held, um, find themselves being held in prison detained for long periods of time. I should mention that, um, and on that point, 
one of uh, at least two of the 15 persons who had been held for over 30 years were held um, of non on non-violent charges like larceny and burglary. There should be special procedures, of course, for detaining and questioning mentally ill. Um, given the nature or their nature, um, we have to recognize that they may not be mentally competent to respond um, to police officers um, in who are trying to detain them and question them. And it's important that they have adequate support as well as legal representation. Uh, and then we need to improve the record for those who are charged detained and sentenced because the records show for many of these persons who are detained for long periods um, that there is there is not information about when they were last evaluated what was the, what was done with the reports of evaluation where they were sent to court what is happening in the court system in relation to those persons and so so there's a need to improve that process um, thank you that's it for me Thank you uh, very much, uh, representatives of Stand Up Jamaica. Are you finished your your civil society presentation? Yes, that's our our final um, final points of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we will turn to the uh, representatives of the commission, starting with Commissioner uh, Jose Jose Luis Caballero for his comments and questions, if you would could have seen us at the distance across the virtual world, you would have seen, oh, we had a lot of expressions on our faces during this very in-depth presentation by the three of you. But Jose Luis, uh, over to you. Muchas gracias, Presidenta, Comisionada Roberta Clark. Me da mucho gusto estar aquí esta mañana. Y saludo al relator Fresca, José Palumo. Saludo al Secretario Ejecutivo Adjunto Peticiones y Casos, Jorge Mesa. Saludo a la sociedad civil jamaica que está, que, a la que hemos escuchado con esfuerzos pues tan importantes en este tema trascendental que son las personas privadas de libertad. Eh, lamento mucho eh, que el Estado no nos acompañe en esta ocasión. Es, es eh, ayer lo, lo, antier, lo decía con, con respecto a otro, a otro Estado, pero sí es, es desalentador que, que los Estados pues no tomen con mucha seriedad, digamos, la supervisión de los organismos internacionales con los que están vinculados con mucha seriedad eh, para atender eh, las solicitudes de la sociedad y más de la sociedad civil organizada que está trabajando con mucho ahínco como, como lo ha hecho evidente la sociedad eh, civil de Jamaica, las mujeres sobre todo que, están, que han estado presentes con nosotros y que tienen pues, un pie puesto en la academia y en la supervisión de en las personas eh, que más lo necesitan, en, en el sentido de las personas eh, reclusas. Eh, quiero preguntar dos cosas en relación con la presencia del Estado, porque también en el informe, eh, digamos, ha, ha habido toda una narrativa de, lo, de hallazgos, de verificación de situaciones complejas, pero quiero preguntar si el Estado ha tomado alguna nota o algún punto que ustedes hayan hecho llegar o por otras personas sobre los temas de la prisión preventiva prolongada, que ha sido un, un punto que han estado ustedes tocando eh, ampliamente en esta audiencia, y si hay algún intento por parte del Estado de revertir ¿no? la prisión preventiva, que además ha sido un, un tema de, de atenta observación por la Comisión Interamericana y la Corte Interamericana. Y eh, el segundo punto, si observan ustedes, parecería que no, pero quiero enfatizar ese punto, algún mecanismo para poder acercar una defensa gratuita eh, de calidad para que pueda llevar adelante. ¿no? Ahorita observamos, yo con, con estupor, asombro, comentábamos esta, este dato de una persona que había permanecido 40 años en prisión, en esas condiciones detenida. Esos dos puntos para, para poder eh, tener información de su parte. Muchas gracias. 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 Gracias.
for economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights for your comments or questions. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Mis saludos también al Comisionado José Luis Caballero, también al Secretario Ejecutivo Adjunto para peticiones y casos de la Comisión Interamericana que, que acompañan esta mesa. Es verdaderamente una lástima que, que no tengamos la oportunidad de desarrollar un diálogo en el marco de esta audiencia ante la ausencia de representación del Estado. La temática del, del sistema penal en, en Jamaica como aspecto problemático lleva muchos años. Yo recuerdo en mi pasaje previo como, como consultor en la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos haber participado de una visita en loco, la, que creo que debe haber sido la última visita en loco a Jamaica en el año 2008, y estas temáticas vinculadas a justicia penal en términos generales, personas privadas de libertad y justicia penal juvenil, eran algunos de, de los temas más, más preocupantes en aquel entonces. Y, y es una mala señal de que, de que haya tanta permanencia de estos temas como temas de especial preocupación. Eh, yo les, les voy a solicitar que puedan enviarnos a la Redesca especialmente toda la información que cuenta en especial en, especial en relación a la, la situación de acceso de las personas en el sistema de privación de libertad, de las personas privadas de libertad, vinculadas a derechos económicos y sociales, específicamente salud, salud mental, alimentación, educación. Esa información será muy valiosa a la hora de realizar nuestro monitoreo y elaborar nuestro informe anual poniendo estas dificultades que ustedes han en forma tan detallada este, comunicado a la comisión en, en nuestro informe anual y en definitiva poder dar cuenta de esta, de esta situación y lograr, espero, en, en próximas oportunidades un diálogo constructivo con autoridades estatales. Muchas gracias. Okay, sorry. Okay. Muchas gracias, Presidente. Igualmente un saludo al Comisionado Caballero, al Relator Especial Palumo. Eh, agradecer mucho la información de Sociedad Civil. Estoy seguro que para la Secretaría de Junta de Monitoreo es bastante importante la, la información eh, que se ha señalado. Desde la perspectiva del sistema de casos, pues mencionar que eh, esta información pues, es muy importante para la Comisión para poder construir eh, contextos eh, que puedan ayudar eh, a facilitar algunos eventuales casos o pronunciamientos de la Comisión. Y en ese sentido quisiera hacer dos preguntas muy concretas. La primera de ellos, y si es que escuché bien porque hubo algún tema en la, en la interpretación, eh, alcancé a tomar nota de que habría alguna prohibición para que algunas entidades pudieran contratar a personas que habrían sido presos o habrían tenido alguna condena. Entonces, precisar si esto es una cuestión de carácter normativo o es una cuestión, digamos, de, de, de práctica. Y en segundo lugar, eh, en relación con la figura de la prisión preventiva, eh, se habló desde una perspectiva en general de la población eh, que está detenida, el problema del hacinamiento y también un porcentaje preocupante respecto de niñez y también personas eh, pues que requieren una atención en salud mental. Entonces, preguntar si la prisión preventiva eh, es declarada judicialmente y requiere el análisis de fines procesales, es decir, peligro de fuga o obstaculización en el proceso, o si en Jamaica existe eh, prisión preventiva automática eh, por determinado tipo de delito. Sería eso, presidente. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. And um, I just want to join uh, my fellow commission team in thanking you for this very thoughtful and pretty uh, evidence-based presentation. Um, criminal, justice, uh, criminal justice reform is a big issue in the Caribbean uh, now and has been for quite a while, um, particularly given the the uptick or the uptick in the levels of violence and insecurity and um, and crime. We find the courts seem pretty overburdened by the demands on them, so they're quite, some of the jurisdictions, quite long periods of pretrial detention and long periods of persons also on bail awaiting trial 
it's a big issue. Um, I think we look to the justice sector for the solution to some of the, to some of these issues, and of course, the justice sector has to be part of the solution, an integral part of the solution. But it's really important that we maybe think about the social and economic determinants of this issue. And I very much appreciated the opening presentation, the, the, the statistic that we got, because I think it's a kind of a key to figuring out how we approach this problem. I think, Maria Carla, you spoke about 82% of the persons who are incarcerated have no skills. And that's, I think, we know from a series of studies, either done through the UN or, I, or the Inter-American Development Bank, that the majority of those who are incarcerated, either pre-trial or post-conviction, are persons who have a very little, very few skills, very little certification, and not really, um, imp or may have had very precarious, uh, low, low skill levels of employment, and oftentimes in the informal sector. So this is a vulnerable population, vulnerable because of socioeconomic background, and and perhaps living in intergenerational poverty, and they enter a prison system um, that has to think about how it can rehabilitate. In other words, you can't leave incarceration worse off than when you entered, or you've not served the purpose of incarceration, which is partly about personal accountability, but also about rehabilitation. So I very much like the focus of Stand Up Jamaica on, your, on rehabilitation. Um, and I understand that you are doing some rehabilitation services, so you have some access to those who are incarcerated, either children, adults, or, or maybe even the mentally ill. So one of my questions is, what is the state, if you know it, um, what is the state's approach to rehabilitation across the life cycle of those who are incarcerated? Um, and then on the question of children, uh, the, you, everyone mentioned the question of the population of children who are incarcerated, which seems quite high. But there's a mixture of persons, of children who are in conflict with the law in the sense of may have, may have committed crimes or, or have been charged with, 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 with crimes, uh, criminal offenses. So there's that, there's that group of children. And it'd be interesting to know what is the age group there. How young does that, do those children get who are incarcerated uh, on pre -trial, pre -trial, in a pretrial detention scenario? So, so there are those, and then there are those children who are who are detained because they are uncontrollable. And in relation to this question of uncontrollability, which is also, I, I think, uh, 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 um, an issue in other, other Caribbean countries, uh, who defines what is uncontrollable and how is that, what is the evidence of that? And are persons, are children sent to detention centers for being uncontrollable further to a court process? or a social, within which social services are involved, what is that process of determining uncontrollability? How do those children come before court and what is that process? And, um, and, and, and what is the, if you know it, what is the average duration of detention for uncontrollability? Um, and, and are these two populations mixed? I guess it's also a question that I'm interested in. And in relation to the, um, those who are mentally ill, I thank you very much for really quite comprehensive um, points um, on this issue. Um, you you did, did say that some persons are, 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 in, are in detention, pre-trial, found unfit to plead, not necessarily by a mental health professional, and may be incarcerated for even a period as much longer than the maximum sentence for the crime that they may have been committed, they, they, have, they, they, may, ha they may have committed and could be convicted of. Um, so my question on that is, are there efforts afoot at a reform, at a closer look at how those who are mentally ill are treated in the, in the criminal justice system? And then finally, Stand up, just stand up, Jamaica. Like other organizations in Jamaica who are focused on the administration of justice, are you all involved with state agencies um, to bring your own perspective and expertise? Are you all consulted on on criminal justice reform and and also on the monitoring of the criminal justice system? How does the state interact with civil society organizations who are paying attention to these issues? Thank you very much.
civil society you have and I also 20, have 20 of, minutes yeah can i give you a couple of answers thank you for these lots of questions i think it help us also to see that there is an interest for your science um, we also regret not to have the Jamaican government with us today to open a dialogue, because dialogue is a key. Um, this also, I, I want to be very frank, for example, we have invested quite an amount of funds that we receive from the European Union and other agencies. And we are considered extremely welcome as donors but we are not considered extremely welcome as partners. I don't know if you understand what I want to say. Um, a donor is okay because it is investing where DTS has not received the big funds from the government, which are not considered a front burner matter. Uh, but when we want to discuss about policies and the implementation, the reputation, et cetera, the situation not as friendly as it is. If I can give the good news, uh, the Bureau of Standard of Jamaica has formed a committee where I'm seeking to, to review the standards and procedures for DCS. Some changes are going to be made. I make sure that I am part of this uh, committee together with Desia, Leslie, which is one of the other families. We hope that the outcomes can bring some difference. Let me give some answers and then I, I will ask my directors to give you the other ones. One, very easy. It is a rule of law that somebody which has been incarcerated cannot be employed by a government agency. I love examples. Some um, months ago, uh, one ex inmate was working as clerk at the Supreme Court, while one of the judges recognized him as somebody which he was meeting a trial and has pretended that the gentleman was fired right away. So it's rule of law. And it's something that we are keeping asking as a major change because to change the mentality government should set an example. We are working quite easily with civil society where we can try to find opportunity, but with private sector and the government most of the times is a no, no answer. Number two, which I want to uh, talk about is pre-detention. Today we were not supposed to mention too much what's is a malpractice in Jamaica. Pre-detention is a drama. It's a drama not only in the prison, but also in the lockup. There is an Indecom report which has been uh, uh, produced the day before yesterday, if I'm not wrong. And we are talking about the lockups and what's happening there. And there is a second and second problem which is additional, which is the state of emergency which is something that the, the last couple of years has been used extensively. Those, those two situations signal a bridge of the basic rights when, when people are detained in a lockup up to 100 days without any charge. Uh, especially where there is a state of emergency, which is justifying the possibility for police and army to apprehend people because they, there is a curfew, so they are not supposed to be going around, or because they are carrying on an operation. People are detained and they are in the lockup. Uh, we went to Montego Bay lockup with the public defender to discover that there were people detained since 180 days without a charge, which was translated in the fact that he lost a job and he also lost his reputation in the community. So the pre-detention is a, is a constant extended problem. Um, major cause is the poor public service. Somebody was asking if there is a free 
if we agency or if we are taught in Islam or something has changed by the Ministry of Justice, there is a body, but it is not particularly efficient. And we have hundreds of complaints about inmates, which let us know they don't know where the trial is. They do not bring to court on their trial day because there is no vehicle. Uh, they forgot their folders somewhere, and the attorneys, unless they are trained, are not that efficient. Allow me to say that we have some attorneys working with us, and we had a long process to discuss what to do in case somebody wants to appeal. Uh, the final decision is not to appeal if the sentence is short, because the, the slow motion of the courthouses for a sentence which are maybe two years risk for them to become a detention up to three, four, five years, which means it's longer than the sentence they have received. So the final decision actually in this moment is if the sentence um, appeal is considered is if the sentence is short, it is much wiser to avoid it to appeal unless you want to stay, you want to be detained longer. Pre detention again is something which is happening because there is a permanent breach of rights. Nobody should be in a lockup for more than 48 hours, nobody should be in pre-detention waiting for a trial for a year, and more than a year. We had two cases in the last six months of somebody which has, uh, one was stealing a bicycle, and another one was also stealing some food, and they are still detained after 11 months without, without reaching the court house, without being entitled to go to trial. So it is something which is extremely negative for more than one reason. One, the individual rights of the person which is deprived of liberty. liberty. Secondly, because in a situation of overcrowding that we have in most of the institutions, those people are contributing to the increase of numbers and there would be no reason at all for them to be there. So, and also there is no form difference between those which have been sentenced and where they are located and those which are waiting. So the last risk is that somebody which is very young or has committed a very small offense will be in direct contact with people which have been uh, responsible for multiple crimes or even worse with people which are detained because they were part of a gang or leading a gang because it's going to affect their life directly and might also be an invitation for them to join them. So that is really something which needs to be considered. And I'm also asking officially, if it's possible, to add lockup situation and the state of emergency, which has allowed special power special power and therefore they have to be locked up forever no possibility to be they take no reason to be detained because there are charges towards them. So I would love now for Daniela and Desia to add their comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carlo, for that intervention. Thanks, President Clark and the commissioners for all the questions. I will tackle the, the, the first question I will tackle is that related to the approach to rehabilitation. So the DCS uses the risk needs responsive, responsivity model. Um, and basically what this model does, it focuses on addressing the individual risk factors, needs, um, and responsivity factors to enhance the effectiveness of re rehabilitation. However, one of the key issues highlighted over the years by the Auditor General was that the very basic um, 
need to assess everybody coming into the care of the DCS was not being met because according to an audit report, um, not everybody was being assessed. And of course, this is uh, the very basis on which the risk needs responsive responsivity model works. But the DCS does um, have its instruments. Um, so yes, so the approach to re rehabilitation is r, &R. Um, It might not be implemented in the same way that it's implemented in the Western world because of resource challenges, but it, on, on paper, it's the r, &R model that is being used. Um, in terms of what the government is doing to address issues related to pre-trial detention, you would have heard Carla speak about um, the Bureau of Standards Jamaica creating correctional standards, minimum standards um, for the treatment of um, persons um, you know, committed to the care of the DCS. So that's one that's been led by the government with stakeholder input. And that's one of the ways we are able to put forward our positions and evidence um, in support of, you know, reform, penal reform. But generally speaking, the government has been trying to strengthen the legislative framework um, and so currently the, the Parole Amendment Act and the, the Correctional Act, um, they're under review. And so that is something that would, uh, you know, probably take into account a number of things, including there has been discussions about um, the question of whether rehabilitation should be mandatory, because one report found that only 21% of adults were participating in available rehabilitation programs. So um, strengthening the legislative framework is one of the ways the government is trying to address um, a number of the issues we highlighted today. Um, in terms of, you would have heard Daniel speak about record management. That's a big, big, big issue, but, um, and of course it affects the, the effectiveness of monitoring and evaluating the, the sector or the department um, or the service itself. But one of the things the government has been trying to do in collaboration with international partners is to to digitize the record management system. So moving away from the largely paper-based systems. Um, and that in itself could address a number of things related to files being misplaced or lost. Um, so that's one of the ways the government is actually also trying to address um, issues related to the length of pre-trial pre detention. But of course, there is a child diversion program in place that seems to have a lot of promise. So whilst the figures are large in terms of remand, and a lot of these figures would have been as a result of um, the court backlog, which the president alluded to, um, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the child diversion program is actually um, showing a lot of promise in diverting um, a number of children away from the criminal justice system. Now, there was a question of, oh, well, I think one of the commissioners requested the sharing of data. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy. We're happy to share with you any available reports we have. Um, just to say that the Economic and Social Survey of Jamaica is um, one, one of Jamaica's main national performance reports, and there's an entire section in there on the DCS. Unfortunately, that section was missing from last year's report, but if you want to do any trend analysis, the Economic and Social Survey of Jamaica is certainly um a good source for that kind of information but also we should be able to share the um the inter-american development bank survey of persons deprived of liberty it's, it's actually free online and then there was a question of whether um 
what is the sociodemographic profile of children in custody. Um, given the data available to us, uh, we know for sure that in 2021, majority were admitted for uncontrollable behavior and disorderly conduct, 23% to be exact. Following that, it would be for breaking um, and larceny related um, convictions. Um, in turn, majority are, are, are male. In terms of age, I believe the president asked about the age, majority were 16. Um, again, when we share any available data, you, you can have a, a more in-depth breakdown or disaggregation of this kind of information. Then the question was raised as to who defines uncontrollable behavior. Um, so the I am aware that the Child Care and Protection Act is also under review, but section 24 of the act gives the family court the power to make a correctional order for a child um, brought before the court by a parent or guardian who feels that the child suffers from uncontrollable behavior. So it's actually defined, well, the Child Care and Protection Act actually uses a terminology, but of course, this is a terminology that is has gone through a number of um discussions and the the idea is to move away from using that terminology because of um it stigmatizes children who just simply they haven't committed an offense or anything they haven't broken the law in any case they, they're only displaying behavioral challenges which um you know has nothing to do with you know violating the law and then they're thrown into this this process of being labeled uncontrollable and so this is one of the things that we think that's def you know we definitely need to to address but generally speaking um parent can bring the child to the children's court if they are unable to control them and according um according to section 24 of the child care and protection act um the court has you know can you know issue an order um a correctional order anything a probation order anything following that um yeah i think those were the few questions that you know from told at me daniel i don't know if you also have an intervention hello um so i i didn't hear some of what you said this year but i will assume that you spoke with about the matters on the um that you're familiar with dealing with child care and and pre-trial detention the only thing i would just add to what was said, um, there was a question about whether or not, uh, or what is the extent of legal representation or support for inmates, especially those who are detained. So Jamaica does have a legal aid act and we have a legal aid council. So persons are able to um, obtain uh, legal representation through this legal aid system However, um, I will say that it's really incumbent upon um, family members or relatives of those who are detained um, to seek out, in many cases, support through the legal aid. In some cases, the court can require legal aid and representation for persons, but it's one of the areas that I think um, is very under, underserved. Um, it's over are under-resourced, you don't have um, enough lawyers to the legal aid system to provide the support that is needed um, for those in, in who have been detained. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank Maria Carla Gulotta, Desia Leslie, and Danielle Andrade for your expertise, your statistics, and your participation in this um, session. 
I, I think uh, one of you may have asked in your presentation about the Inter-American Standards on pretrial detention, um, but within the Inter-American system, the only legitimate grounds for pretrial detention are twofold. One, where there's a risk that the person charged will evade justice, and secondly, the accused will attempt to obstruct the criminal investigation itself. Um, so it's quite, uh, pretrial detention is meant to be an exceptional approach, not, not the first resort and not the norm. So just to let you know that's from the inter-American point of view. Um, I, th I also thank you for giving some information on the government's, the, the state's um, ongoing efforts to strengthen the legislative framework, in particular the Parole Act, and I think you have a number of recommendations which I'm sure you have given to the state on how the parole um, process can be uh, characterized by fairness and objectivity um, as far as, as needed. You've also spoken about the, uh, the, the efforts to strengthen the Correction Act as well as the Child Care and, and Protection Act. And I'm sure that there are many other uh, initiatives of the state to strengthen the justice sector and to respond to those who are most vulnerable uh, in the, and who are, being, uh, who are incarcerated uh, for any number of reasons. So just to say thank you for your participation. Um, we look forward to any information you can send us, reports and statistics, and we do note your guidance on going to the, um, the, the, the Economic and Social Survey, the Jamaica Survey, as a source of information for the Commission. I'm sure we, we will all um, pay attention to that recommendation. So it's just left for me now to thank everyone for their participation and to bring the hearing to a close. Thank you very much. That if I am allowed to say thanks.